This is the Weather Lounge here at Weatherworks. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Weather Lounge, your favorite go-to podcast about weather. I'm your host, meteorologist Brad Miller, and I would like to thank you for joining us from our Weatherworks headquarters in Hackettstown, New Jersey. And joining me, as always, is my incredibly talented co-host, meteorologist Mike Mahalik. Hey there, Mike. Hey, Brad. How's it going? How's it going there? Hey, I got to say, that seemed a little flat of an Why? introduction for me. Well, you know, <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm not, I, you know, I'm not on the podcast last week or the last podcast that you guys, uh, you and Jim kind of hogged it all up and kind of kicked me to the curb, but I'll let it slide because, you know, it, it was uh, basically a, a wrap up of the winter and just the two of you were plenty uh, needed to kind of talk about it. So well, You're on the 10 day IL. It's fine. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it was a good podcast, though. I got to say, you know, we had our chief meteorologist Jim Sullivan in, yeah. Um, you know, and you guys just kind of finally put our winter in the, uh, I guess, rear view meter, and we can finally focus on summer and uh, other things. Yeah. Hey, speaking of Jim, though, we're gonna have him right back on. Yeah. Yeah. Jim is back. Yeah. No. I mean, uh, we're gonna have Jim on again today. Um, our chief meteorologist here at Weatherworks, and he's going to talk about the upcoming hurricane season. He's also going to talk about the summer pattern uh, across the United States and into the Midwest and Northeast, where a lot of our clients are centered. Um, but uh, I think it's going to be a really fun discussion. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, you know we're in full swing now into summer. You know, uh, mid June here. You know, we've already had our first kind of a taste of summer a few weeks ago. Uh, you know, temperatures got into the 80s and 90s across parts of the Northeast. And then, uh, you know, it's still officially spring, though, Mike, don't forget. But, you know, we're turning the uh, the calendar into summer here next week. And it's, uh, you know, we'll we'll see how it all unfolds because uh, that's what Jim's going to talk about here uh, in just a few minutes. So we'll take a break. And on the other side, again, we'll have Chief Meteorologist Jim Sullivan here at Weatherworks for our summer preview and hurricane outlook for this upcoming year. Have you ever needed weather data for a snow removal contract? How about a slip and fall incident? Searching for the information online may sound simple enough, however it can be tedious and difficult. Good news! Our data and stats team can simplify the process. We'll find any weather information from daily rainfall and snowfall totals to hourly temperatures and seasonal averages. On the legal side, our forensic department routinely produces certified reports by meteorologists assessing the weather conditions on and around accident dates. So don't waste your valuable time. Give WeatherWorks a call today at 908-850-8600 or email us at data at weatherworksinc.com. Remember, when you think weather, think WeatherWorks. And welcome back, everybody, to the Weather Lounge. I'm meteorologist Mike Mahalik, and I'm joined again, as always, with Brad Miller. Brad, it's time for us to bring in our guest, I think. Yeah. Right? Two yeah. podcasts in a row, our own chief meteorologist here at Weatherworks, Jim Sullivan, uh, is about to join us, and we're, uh, again, going to talk about the summer outlook and the outlook for the hurricane season here as we uh, are now a couple of weeks into the Atlantic hurricane season. And I think Jim is on right now. Jim, yeah, yeah, how Here you doing? I am. All right, man, two podcasts in a row. I don't know yeah. how you tricked me into this, but... <laughs> <laughs> We just, uh, yeah, we just reverse flipped. I don't know. We just uh, kind of quickly got you on. And uh, Jim, we promise we won't bother you again now until uh, the winter outlook uh, in a few months. So you get, a, you get a couple of months off now. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll mark that down. Well, no, certainly no problem. Always fun being on. I, I, I bet our, our listeners out there love this. Uh, having the uh, chief meteorologist, long range guy on two days in a row. I think that's fun. But, uh, Jim, let's start out. Um, we want to talk about the hurricane season uh, coming up here. And, uh, you know, we're into June here now. And, um, you know, let's talk about it a little bit, you know. Man, yeah, it feels like last season, you know, hard, hardly ended a few weeks ago because it, it raged on through most of November. And then we had a, a decent winter uh, this year, actually, which kept us busy. And now all of a sudden, yeah. Hurricane season is upon us again. Yeah, def definitely here. And um, 
you know, uh, I'm not going to steal any of your thunder uh, here for the forecast, um, but uh, <laughs> I don't want to give away anything. But, uh, you know, going into this year, there's a few uh, changes uh, at the start of the season. Uh, there's been thoughts of possibly starting a hurricane season a little bit sooner. I know that's been going around in the meteorological community. Well, I don't, that's, a, that's a hot debate. Um, yeah, any thoughts on that, Jim? I, 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 I personally don't like getting caught up in the semantics um, just because I have other things that I worry about more. Um, I do think what they did this year, they kind of did a compromise. They kept the start date of the season June 1st, but they started issuing their regular outlooks in the middle of May. That's kind of a compromise. Um, and they're, they're, you know, there've been a lot of systems before June 1st, the last few years, most of them are weak. They're either out to sea or they're more rainmakers, but still, you know, you have a tropical storm that, you know, maybe brings flooding rains, certainly something to be prepared for. So I think at, at the very least what they did this year is a nice compromise. Yeah, I think I know where it's going. <laughs> <laughs> they're next year or two years or and you know, they're gonna come out with Yeah, usually when we hear these kinds of rumblings, they they eventually move in that direction. So yeah, we'll see. You know, I'm seeing some other sources out there, um like Colorado State University is going for another active season. What do you think, Jim? Active, non-active? I know last year was crazy. Um, so many storms. I don't think that was that. That was a record, right? That was a record. Yep. Yeah. So, I, you know, I think we can say that a repeat of last year is quite unlikely, but signs are leaning towards another active season. Um, you know, whereas last year heading in, it was almost like all signs pointed towards an active season. This year, they're slightly more mixed. Uh, but still are kind of pointing in a more active direction. So, so Jim, what, what are the main ingredients, though, that would differentiate, uh, you know, maybe a, a below normal season versus a more active season like we saw last year and what we're expecting this year? I mean, I mean, uh, you know, just the, the, the basics, uh, the, the, that change between the two. All right. So, yeah, there's a number of things we look at heading into a season to make a forecast. And the first and one of the more important things we look at is the water temperatures, both in the Atlantic, because those are what fuel the storms themselves, and also around the globe, especially in the tropics, because warmer or cooler waters elsewhere can drive patterns that indirectly influence uh, Atlantic hurricanes. So um, last year, we had a La Nina during the peak of the hurricane season. That is when waters are cooler across the tropical Pacific than normal, um, and that favors an active season in the Atlantic, usually. Um, this year, the La Nina has weakened, um, and we're probably going to have a pretty neutral situation in the Pacific through the hurricane season. Um, there might be a little bit of like a La Nina hangover, if you will, just because um, there is a bit of a lag between the ocean and the, the response in the atmosphere. So it's kind of like, you know, that's more of a mixed signal. Maybe it leans towards a slightly active season on its own, but it's not like last year where we just kind of had a full-blown La Nina. Um, another area we look is the Indian Ocean, believe it or not, because warm waters in the Indian Ocean do two things. Um, they kind of, so a lot of the systems that develop, especially in the peak of the hurricane season, they're tropical waves that come from the Indian Ocean across Africa and into the Atlantic, and then they develop. So warm Indian Ocean waters kind of give those tropical waves or those seeds, if you will, for our storms a little more fuel. Um, so the Indian Ocean is quite warm again this year. It was warm heading into last season. So that is a signal for maybe some more activity. Um, and also the warm Indian Ocean might kind of give us a more La Nina atmospheric response, even though the Pacific is neutral. Um, just because in a La Nina, there tends to be more thunderstorms over the Indian Ocean. And, you know, even though we don't have a La Nina, the warm Indian Ocean itself might kind of give a similar effect. So, you know, just kind of looking at the oceans across the, the world, um, you know, maybe leaning towards another active season, but not quite as strong of a signal as last year since it's more neutral in the Pacific. Yeah, I was just looking at the uh, 2020 Pacific season. Uh, there were uh, 17 named storms last year um, versus, I guess, you know, what we have 30 here in the Atlantic. Uh, right. Would... It's it's very hard for both the Atlantic and the Eastern Pacific to be very active. And they had a fair amount of storms in the Pacific, like 17 named storms. It's pretty close to average for the, for the Eastern Pacific. 
Uh, but they didn't have all that many like really strong hurricanes in the east. No, it was only four hurricanes actually. So right, which is very very low. So you know that kind of shows like it was quiet in the Pacific last year with the you know partially because of the La Nina very active in the Atlantic. And and Jim, the uh, you're talking about La Nina and, and you're thinking kind of we're going to have a hangover. It's going to be neutral. Is there any chance to go to El Nino uh, later in the or later in the year, or is that kind of pretty much off the table? Um, it's not impossible. Um, you know, the waters have been pretty steadily warming across the Pacific. And if that trend were to continue, it's it's not ruled out that it, you know, a weak El Nino maybe develops by by the fall. Um, I'm personally leaning against it, though, because of the warm Indian Ocean, because, like I said, even though it isn't a La Nina itself, it kind of gives a La Nina response um, by by keeping the thunderstorms kind of over the Indian Ocean and it alters pressure patterns in such a way that I'm kind of leaning against El Nino developing the summer. It's not impossible, but if it happened, I think it would be weak and late in the summer and not a, not a huge influence through the hurricane season. Yeah. Because obviously if El Nino breaks out, then we're talking the opposite about... of La Nina. Right, so yeah, yeah it can, yeah. it can put a lid on activity. Right. Increase shear, tearing storms apart, all that kind exactly. of business. Right. Yeah, exactly. It's just amazing to me as a meteorologist, you know, obviously too. And just how, and this is this is just so I think cool when you talk about how the Indian Ocean has an impact on the Atlantic hurricane season and the Pacific, and I'm sure even the Southern Hemisphere. It's just how everything kind of just all works together, and uh, it's it's that's the one thing I, I think is the coolest part of meteorology is just how it's just a one big cycle, and there's a lot of smaller cycles within the big cycles, and it's just uh, it's just something I, I still to this day uh, just amazed at. Yeah, it's amazing. Like the whole the whole atmosphere, the whole globe, it's just a giant fluid. Somehow it's basically. all connected, right. Right, exactly. Um, so yeah, I guess along those similar lines, um, you know, maybe if we want to talk about water temperatures a little closer to home in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, you know, kind of a mixed signal at, at this point compared to, to last year. So it's very very warm outside of the tropics. Um, so the tropics, that's the part of the basin that's closer to the equator. Basically, once you kind of get south of like the Bahamas, we'll say it's the tropics. Um, so it's very warm kind of like in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. It's a little bit cooler um, across the, the the tropics, which gives a mixed signal, might, might signal that systems outside of the tropics, like kind of in the middle of the ocean, maybe in the Gulf of Mexico near the East Coast, they might have a little more fuel because of that warm water, but we'll have to see how those tropical waters evolve because, you know, some of the long track hurricanes that might develop near the peak of season, they usually start in the tropics. So um, that's a little bit of a mixed signal in the Atlantic. Um, a lot of our forecast guidance, which again, it's it's a little bit susceptible to errors the farther out you go, or is very susceptible to errors, I should say, the farther out you go. But uh, some of our forecast guidance suggests those tropical waters will warm during the hurricane season, which would kind of point that towards a more active signal. So right now it's like a mixed signal in the Atlantic, maybe, but might trend towards something favoring more activity. So again, kind of like I said early on, whereas last season heading in, almost everything was like, yeah, it's going to be active. This year, a lot of stuff still points in that direction, but a little bit more mixed. Yeah, I was going to say, um, you talk about, you know, cooler waters in the tropics, but... It's relatively cool compared to normal. They're still quite warm. <laughs> yeah, I hope um, our listeners realize that, you know, when we're talking about cooler waters, you know, we're not talking about it's going to be cold water uh, right. in the tropics. They're still warm. Right. It's like, you know, maybe instead of 83 degrees, it's 80 degrees, you know, something like that. Right. And you need water temperatures above... Uh, about what? 80 about 80 yeah yeah so to to fuel those hurricanes so yeah, that's that's interesting to note there i wonder what will happen with those uh, waves coming off africa uh, as it runs into that cooler than normal water even though it's still warm it's just not bad not quite as warm as it could be yeah but it's of course how long it goes across the atlantic you know where those warmer eddies are and you know pockets of 85 to 90 degree water and you know what's the shear? What's the, what's going on with the shear at that point and things like? And what about the Bermuda High this year? Is it is it seem like it's going to be stronger? I mean, are the storms going to get pushed push further west or more out to sea? I mean, you see anything so, with that? Yeah. So early. So I guess we'll kind of maybe start with the pattern over the U.S. It's all kind of you know interconnected. Um, so 
it looks like over the U.S., and this will bleed into the summer outlook, which we'll get into in the second part of the podcast, but it looks like there's going to generally be a ridge in the jet stream over the western U.S. That means the jet stream will kind of go up and around the western U.S. That'll keep them hotter. It'll keep them dry in a lot of cases, which is unfortunate because as we'll maybe touch on a little later, they're still in quite a drought out there. So we, we kind of expect a ridge over the west. And then we kind of expect a dip in the jet stream somewhere over the central or eastern U.S. and then the Bermuda High off the coast. So the kind of there's kind of going to be an interplay between the Bermuda High and that little dip in the jet stream. And it looks like early in the season, like maybe July, especially maybe into August, it looks like the dip in the jet stream will be closer to the east coast. Um, with maybe a bit of a weaker Bermuda high, and that might draw some systems towards the U.S. East Coast or the Southeast. And then it looks like maybe heading into later August, September, the Bermuda high might flex its muscles a little more, which might push stuff farther west towards like Florida or the Gulf of Mexico, maybe the Caribbean, depending on where it is. So yeah, kind of a, you know, probably going to evolve a little bit through the season, but having a weakness or a dip in the jet stream Somewhere over the central or eastern U.S., it's those dips in the jet stream that the storms kind of seek out because they want to kind of recurve or, or, you know, track towards the higher latitudes and they'll go through those dips in the jet stream. So where those occur, you know, there might be other dips out in the open Atlantic that can steer some storms out to sea, but there's probably going to be another one somewhere central or eastern U.S. that where that is might determine is it the east coast that's threatened the Gulf of Mexico or maybe even the Caribbean. Right. And that's, is that pretty much your favorite tracks for this year then uh, for these uh, systems? Yeah. yeah. I think there's a couple of favorite tracks. Um, one will be, um, you know, any systems that do make it into either the Caribbean or the Western Atlantic, they'll either, you know, you know, they'll curve somewhere between, you know, just off the East coast, perhaps early in the season, we see some storms curve, you know, just off the East coast and then maybe into the middle of the season, they track more towards the Gulf of Mexico or Caribbean. Um, I think there is another track, especially towards the middle of the season. There's signals that there's a dip in the jet stream somewhere over the central or eastern Atlantic. So there might be some storms that come off Africa, develop and just recurve way out to sea and don't do much to to any land, which is uh, obviously the preferred outcome. Right. And then it would be uh, possibly a problem for Europe. <laughs> As it makes yeah, transition. I mean, some of those storms they can, yeah, they can recurve and you know transition into what we call a extra tropical or non tropical storm and still bring some wind and rain. Wasn't there um, a couple of storms last year that were very close to Europe? Um, I thought there was. There were, or it might have been a couple years ago. There was, I remember there were a couple of. There was one noteworthy one. It might have been what 2018, where it actually produced like quite a bit of wind damage and and like a. Uh, like Ireland, the UK, um, I believe. Almost seems like some of those storms get stronger too after they get over there. I guess because they get more, uh, I guess, strung out. But still, the wind, the wind potential is still pretty high. Yeah, no, those those transitioning systems. I mean, Sandy was a transitioning system. Um, yeah, because there's like kind of two energy sources for tropical systems. It's the warm water beneath them. But for non-tropical systems, it's more temperature differences, the jet stream. And, you know, if the jet stream is strong, sometimes those tropical systems can kind of transition into a strong non-tropical system. Um, Isaias kind of was similar. It was transitioning a little bit. That's why it kind of held so much intensity up the East Coast last year. Yeah, I was just going to say that, <laughs> um, that I'm pretty sure Is Isaias had the same sort of idea. It was, yeah. Um, with that system. Um, Let's but, not have another name like that either. Oh, well, you know, it's it's it was, you know, it was a tough name to say. But hey, you know, we gotta we gotta there spread the been... love. You can't all have uh, you know Bill or something. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we gotta mix up those names a little. Well, even even with the common names like uh, this year, uh, you know, Henry's back, but of course we all know it's not pronounced Henry. That's true. I didn't know that. Boy, it's. It's a good thing you guys had me on, or else I would have been mispronouncing that. <laughs> you see, it ends in an I, so we're going with Henri. Yeah, it's been around for a long time, too. It hasn't been, uh, I can remember Henri, I mean, a long time ago, back in like the 80s, I think. Uh, I was really young, and it was still around. I almost say let's retire that name just because it confuses me. But if you, <laughs> to retire a name, a storm has to do a lot of damage. So maybe we'll just keep it in circulation. 
<laughs> right. But then at first, when I looked at the names, I, I, I thought that we were going to go on a, uh, like a Disney's Frozen kick because I saw Anna and I saw Elsa on the list and I was like, what? Are they going with a, uh, a Frozen kick here or what's going on? But then, you know, the other ones, you know, like Henri, obviously, and you know, Grace and Julian and, you know, it's, yeah, we'll say a lot of, oh, I see, yeah, a lot of the, a lot of one and two syllable names this year. Um, yeah, I see yeah, that. Bill, Fred, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Larry. Yeah, I know. It's like, it's like the, it's, it's a very common sort of name. It, it, a lot of common names on there, so. You know, but uh, my name has uh, been retired, and we don't need another Michael, that's for sure. No. Because um, I'm sure Florida um, did not like me. Uh <laughs> <laughs> last year yeah category five yeah, yeah pretty amazing or, or a couple of years ago I should say. yeah um but something interesting that developed this year was that if we do make it through all of our name storms there's been a change there's a supplemental list now and last year we obviously saw the greek letters alpha and Zeta and Iota and Ada and all these things. Yeah, looking at some of those maps during peak season, it looked like a frat house running around out there in the <laughs> Atlantic with all those Greek letters. Not the same frat house as I remember at Penn State, <laughs> but uh, a little bit different. Um, but um, no, it's, and and they're going to start using a supplementary list of names, Jim. And um, so, how is this working this year? Yeah, so. Yeah, basically what the system was, and we only used it twice, uh, 2005 being the first time, 2020 last year being the second and final time, was it used to be, we have the list of names, it's 20-some names, and then you run out of them, you know, because that's how many letters in the alphabet you are, you run out of names, and it used to just be, okay, we'll use Greek letters, just we'll name storms Greek letters, so, you know, you'll get, you know, Tropical Storm Alpha, Hurricane Zeta, Iota, um, and... It's just awkward. It's just very awkward to go from names to um, <laughs> Greek letters and, uh, you know, maybe cause some confusion. So I guess just to kind of keep it more consistent with just, you know, another list of names to to go through, um, you know, so there's a list of what is that? It's like another 21 names um, that of, of supplemental storms to go through. You know, if we get back into if we exhaust the, the initial list of 21 names again. And and these now these names are not quite as simple. They're they're very off the wall. And, and and Brad and I were looking at this list the other day, and we were like, "Wow, um, I don't know if I've heard of a Carl Dad before." <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's only so many. Uh, there's only so many names out there. Uh, yeah, I know. I mean, we, still... we've already used a lot of them because you know we are we have we have a rotating list of we have six rotating lists of names that are used every year. That's 21 names per list. So that's 126 names already. Plus the ones that have been retired. Usually we retire maybe one or two a year. Um, last year we retired three, including two Greek letters. That that's the other thing. It's like, how do you retire a Greek letter from <laughs> names? We retired Ada and Iota were the two Greek letters that were quote unquote retired last year because they ravaged Central America in November. Um, and we also retired Laura, which hit Louisiana with 150 mile an hour winds and did a lot of damage near Lake Lake Charles. So, um, yeah, it's I think it's just better. It's more hopefully just helps keep um, you know doesn't confuse the public when all of a sudden their Greek names you know coming at the coast. Now, now I, I want to know, and I, I don't maybe wouldn't you guys know this? I, I still don't know the answer. Is, are these names going to be used now every year? Yeah, it's one it's one supplemental list I per think. year. No, just total. Oh, okay, um, so Adria can actually be used two years in a row. It could, I believe so. Yeah, I, I, that's true. I don't know if they would maybe just keep going down the list. Right. Because that's what they do in the Central Pacific, I believe. They don't have rotating lists because they don't get that many storms there, like near Hawaii. I think they just have one or two lists that they just might cycle through. So they might do something like that, where if we have Adria this year. And you pick up on Braden, Braylon next year. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Some of these are some interesting names. Heath, uh, Jacobus. Um you know, Jake, Jacob. Yeah, if anyone's <laughs> listening to you know the answer to that question, please let us know because I, I did a whole bunch of, I looked up everywhere and just to figure out if they were going to, you know, have a new list each year. But yeah, I don't think it's, it's going to be a, a... It's one supplemental list for sure. I just don't know how they're going to go through it. Like if it starts at Adria every time or right. if they just keep going through the list. 
again, it's only happened twice so far in recorded history. Um, you know, probably more prone to happen now than in the past, just because we're we're better at detecting the weaker storms than we were before satellites were up in up in space looking down at us. So, you know, it's easier to go through the names a little bit quicker. Um, you know, because the average number of storms has gone from you know ten in the nineteen hundreds to fourteen now. So uh, pretty pretty soon, the way things are going, we're going to start giving these hurricanes serial numbers. <laughs> Hurricane one three five six <laughs> coming up the coast. Ah, uh, sorry, bad joke. But uh, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> yeah. So, gosh, do we have do we have any more any more topics to to broach here with with the tropics or uh, no other topics to broach? I don't think. I mean, I think we went through the the, the tracks and everything. But one thing I just wanted to note that um, you know. These hurricanes and tropical systems, they don't just occur in, like, the Pacific and, and the Atlantic. I mean, they occur all over, all over, even even in the Mediterranean, which I find interesting. Um, I think they call them medicanes. Yeah, that medicanes. Right? Um, Medicaid. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, hurricanes, tropical storms. Yeah, I mean, they, they occur in the Western Pacific. Those are they're called typhoons. Um, same type of storm, just different part of the world, different name. Um, they just call them cyclones in Australia or the Indian Ocean. Uh, you know, very, very direct and to the point there, a cyclone. Um, but they can still be just as damaging. And yeah, um, the ones in the Mediterranean Sea, they're not classic hurricanes just because it's a little cooler there. Uh, but it's the same type of process. You can get thunderstorms over the relatively warm waters of of the sea. And occasionally you get a little system. There was a pretty strong one, I think, last fall, um, if I remember pr- correctly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I oh, man, I believe that one was actually very strong. It might have had like a hundred mile an hour winds or so. I, I remember looking at it, but I don't know the exact song. Yeah, and um, I know I know it did some damage, but maybe even produced some tornadoes and flooding rain, like tropical cyclones do. So, yeah, definitely an interesting thing. It, it happens every now and then up there. And I know there's not much activity that happens in the southern Atlantic, right? I mean, it has very rare. Um, you know, the southern, you know, the southern Pacific, like Australia, that's a little bit more common. Um, Australia has been hit by some some very powerful cyclones over the years. Um, yeah, southern Atlantic is the one basin where really not much happens. I think there's maybe been a, a few recorded like tropical cyclones on record. Um, part of that just is because the waters are a lot cooler down there. Um, so that, that, you know, lack of lack of warm water, lack of fuel for these storms. Well, I just thought it was important that you know people understand that it's not just the Atlantic that experiences these storms, no, it's but all uh, over. Um, Jim, uh, one last thing: um, what are your exact numbers here for tropical systems this year? I think that's the last yes. thing that we put them on the spot. I, I hey, I have to, you know, you know, yeah. Let me let me pull it up. I don't want to misspeak here. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we're kind of going for we we go with ranges. Um, it was to kind of give just because it's. You know, sometimes we don't know five or seven days out if a storm's going to develop, so it's really hard to predict it on the nose ahead of time. So the historic average, um, you know, over the last 30 years, and these numbers have been updated this year uh, to take into account the last decade, the average is 14 name storms, uh, seven hurricanes, and three major hurricanes. That's the average. Um, you know, so name storms were going between 13 and 17. Um Again, I would probably lean a little bit more towards the upper end of that. But like I said, there are some mixed signals. Um, so we're kind of going with basically a near to a little bit above average number of name storms. We're going for six to ten hurricanes. Again, near to, you know, a little bit above average there. And about three major hurricanes, um, you know, two or three. So near average number of major hurricanes. So, you know, again, we're kind of going, we're leaning more active than normal, but more reserved than last year. And again, we'll see how it goes. Last year, we thought our, our forecast was pretty crazy. It was crazy forecasting, maybe 20 named storms ahead of time. And I think we had like three to six major hurricanes ahead of time. So we were forecasting up to double the amount of major hurricanes ahead of time and nearly double the amount of named storms ahead of time compared to normal. And our forecast last year was still too low. That's pre- It's just remarkable how active it was. So yeah, that's, that's where we're at right now. And you know, we'll, we'll see how it evolves. Of course, the old cliche that we tell everyone, it only takes one storm to make it a memorable year. So, I mean, whether we have seven named storms or 20, you know, if that one impacts you, 
and you know it uh, it makes a landfall near you and you know you're you're dealing with it it's it's a memorable year and that goes you know for any year really and i mean uh... Jim, I don't know if I really want to ask you about where you think it's going to make impact because that is a very hard thing to do at this point. Hard to know ahead of time. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, if you want to, if I, if you, you know, general guess, um, again, I am worried about that little weak spot in, in the jet stream somewhere over the central or eastern U.S. at times during the season that could draw some storms up. Again, I think if the, mid-Atlantic or northeast are threatened I think it's more the first half of the season like maybe July or August and I think you know maybe later August September it shifts more towards the southeast Florida the Gulf Coast if anywhere um you know again, again though we'll, we'll see you know it depends on how strong that Bermuda high gets where that little weak spot in the jet stream is but there there is there you know the pattern looks like it would support if there are storms in that part of the Atlantic that they might threaten parts of the U.S. at various times and again, you know, Caribbean's always at risk. Um, you know, mixed signals there between some some analog years we looked at and some some model guidance. Some models are actually quite dry in the Caribbean during the hurricane season, which might suggest decreased activity. Uh, but again, we'll see. It only takes one. Um, well, I think um, many in the Caribbean would be uh, happy with a less than normal amount of storms. <laughs> yes, um, especially yeah. um, Puerto Rico and what they endured uh, with Maria with Maria, and all right. that. So, um, but I think that about wraps it up for the hurricane portion uh, of this podcast. Jim was kind enough to give us his thoughts and even the number of storms and where we think those uh, impacts are possible. Um, so we're going to take a quick break. After the break, we're going to bring Jim back on. He's going to stay with us to talk about the summer forecast across the United States. So guys, stay with us. Hey everybody, well how many times have you been burned by a weather forecast? Well, probably a few and it might have cost your business thousands. WeatherWorks is different. We have over 30 meteorologists to give you forecasts, notifications, and weather advice 24-7. Now that can certainly help when it comes down to making those crucial decisions, but there are even more products than that in which WeatherWorks offers, from weather data to historical reports. Call us at 908-850-8600 or visit us on the web at weatherworksinc.com. And oh, don't forget, when you think weather, think WeatherWorks. All right, welcome back to the Weather Lounge. I'm your host, meteorologist Brad Miller. And of course, I have Mike Mahalik here with me and also our chief meteorologist here at Weatherworks, Jim Sullivan. In the uh, first half of the podcast, we talked about the hurricane season upcoming. Uh, now, the second half, we're going to talk about the upcoming summer outlook and uh, really kind of goes hand in hand with the entire pattern for the hurricane outlook. Uh, you know, we have the heat, the troughs, and the ridges. So, uh, so Jim, uh, give us an outlook here of what you think is going to happen here as we go on through the rest of June, July, and even into August. Yeah, so I guess, yeah, kind of in general, um, you know, so it's you know, been a slow start kind of to summer-like weather here in the Northeast. So finally, the second half of May, we really, you know, finally started warming up here. But yeah, I mean, severe season, you know, there was some severe weather in March across um, the, the southern U.S., um, but otherwise severe season was rather slow until, um, kind of the second half of May, um, in the Northeast Midwest, Great Lakes, you know, was kind of warm and dry in March and then kind of cool and wet in April. And then May kind of started cool, dry. Um, and now we're finally warming up. So yeah, over the next few weeks, um, in general, or really in general, I do think it's a warm summer across the country as a whole. Um, I think the bulk of the heat is focused out west, but, um, you know, so it's maybe somewhat cooler out east, but not necessarily chilly. Um, so, yeah, kind of heading into June, you know, seems like, you know, it'll be a warm month across the country. Maybe the first half of the month is is warmest across the western U.S. and the eastern U.S. with a little bit of cooler weather across the, the midsection of the country and then maybe later in June. Uh, you know, the central part of the country trends a little warmer. Maybe New England gets a little cool down later in June. But in general, kind of looking towards a, a warm June across the country. So kind of a continuation of the second half of May in those regards um, after after a chilly first half of May. Now, I know, Jim, that um, out in the western United States, it's been very dry. Um, a lot of drought going on out there. Um, how do you see that impacting things this summer? Yeah, so... Um, you know, in summer, the the larger scale weather pattern, like the 
the jet stream, you know, that's kind of the, the stream of faster moving air, 30, 40,000 feet up. Um, the jet stream's a little weaker in the summer, so things like soil conditions, like is it a drought, is it wetter than normal, they can have a little bit more of a pronounced impact. And the, the saying is that drought begets drought, uh, which means if you're dry, you kind of are favored to continue to be a little bit hotter, a little bit drier, um, just because it's very, very easy for the sun to heat up a dry ground and, and, and warm you up and keep you dry. So there is some concern, you know, because not only does the pattern look like it'll support warm and dry conditions out west, it's already dry there. Um, so it's kind of like a double whammy. So very worried about the western drought just getting worse because uh, last year was a very bad fire season. Um, not much relief out there overall over the winter. Um, so I'm worried about how it plays out there this summer. I guess if there is one possible bright spot, there are some signals that the monsoon, um, which is something that happens every year in the southwestern U.S. where it does get a little more humid, it can rain a little bit more in like July and August, uh, there are some signals that the monsoon might be strong enough this year to at least bring some rain to like the Four Corners region, the desert southwest. southwest. Uh, but, you know, so hopefully that happens and because they're just in an exceptional drought. That's like the highest drought category. Um, it's like exceptional drought. And a lot of the southwest is in that. So maybe there's a little bit of relief there if the monsoon can come through. But other than that, yeah, very worried that the drought just continues, if do if not gets worse through the summer out there. Yeah, I mean, even even last year, you talked about the fires that were so bad. I mean, geez, we had smoke even on the East Coast. Oh, I remember uh, that. It I was. Remember. I, I cannot remember smoke being quite that thick. It was so thick that it was messing with high temperatures. Yeah. Um. There, there were, you know, there was a week there where temperatures were coming in a few degrees cooler than we thought. Usually, it's the other way around. If it's sunny, if anything, it'll be warmer than we think. But no, it was. It was completely sunny except for the smoke, which acted like almost like a deck of clouds. Yeah, um, it was very, very weird. Maybe for was... some uh, incredible sunsets though last year, I remember that. Yeah, so yeah, I don't quite remember. Uh, maybe it's happened before, uh, but I personally, I don't remember seeing fire smoke that thick. Um, and it was for a few days too. It was like you know, better part of a week, I think. Yeah, it was almost like there was a pretty good layer of cirrus cloud over um, the area. Just you know really blocking out the sun i just it was kind of it was, i'm with you it was kind of strange you know i guess that's uh the whole problem with the uh, volcanoes if they want to explode cataclysmically uh, yeah <laughs> they're gonna throw all kinds of stuff in the atmosphere well it was 40 years ago that mount st helens uh last month they were uh they were showing that i saw that a lot on social media when, when uh, that occurred in 1981 um, that has such uh, such impacts all around the globe. Are we sure it was eighty one. Are we right on that? Yeah, I think it was forty years ago. I wouldn't know, guys. Nineteen eighty. I was forty one years ago. Forty one years ago. Way to go, Brad. Yeah, no, we sorry. missed we missed the big anniversary by one year here with this podcast. Yeah, no, it was uh, uh, March sixteenth, nineteen eighty. Um, May May sixteenth. May sixteenth. Right? Yeah. Well, it, no, it, yeah, it started to show its first signs in March. I yeah, guess. okay, okay, uh, and, and then it, and then it finally exploded, uh, blew its top. Uh, yeah, yeah, literally. Yeah, I mean everything uh, blew. So let's hope stuff like that doesn't happen. I mean that that could be a a monkey wrench for everything, uh, you know. But um, but yeah, I mean I am worried about those wildfires, wildfires, just like you, Jim. Um, but you know, you, you talked about June a little bit, you know. Let's head into July a little bit more. Um, what are we expecting here across the country? Yeah, so, you know, as we kind of mentioned in the tropical portion, I think a, a big thing we're going to be tracking is where is there that little dip or weakness in the jet stream over the summer? Um, because, you know, it'll be hot over the west and it'll be relatively cooler or more seasonable, at least, and probably wetter where that dip in the jet stream is. And, you know, in June, it might be somewhere over the central U.S. to start, over New England maybe later in the month. And then July, it looks like, you know, somewhere over the central and eastern U.S., like maybe over the Mississippi, Ohio Valley into the southeast and mid-Atlantic. Somewhere in there is where there might be that dip in the jet stream in July with very warm weather out west, probably pretty warm on the other side of that dip. So maybe that's New England is still pretty warm in July. Um, so, yeah, July looks like, again, a warm month nationally overall, but with with a 
relatively smaller area of more seasonable weather, kind of maybe over the southeastern portions of the country focused there. You think that's going to lead to more severe weather in July or? Um, I, maybe a little bit. Um, you know, honestly, having a dip in the jet stream there isn't the best spot for severe weather. Um, you know, maybe, you know, if you have the dip in the jet stream there, it can draw tropical moisture towards the East coast. So maybe there's a flooding threat. Um, you know, we're, we're dry right now and we actually could use some rain here in most of the Eastern United States as well. Um, you know, we had an active winter, but we've dried out quickly here over the last few weeks. So, you know, honestly, we could probably use some rain and I think we'll get some in June as well. Um, so what maybe about, not a, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, what about the old buzzword, uh, derecho potential this upcoming summer? You know, I, 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 I know that some other outlets explicitly forecast that and I'm not really going to touch it just because right, I agree, <laughs> you know, again, sometimes we don't know if it's a derecho until after it happens True. and we kind of plot like, okay, here's where, here's how long the damage path was here, how strong the winds were. Um, you know, and the word derecho, I think gets a bad buzz. It or, does. A, it's, it's overhyped because derechos, there's usually several derechos every year somewhere in the U S um, last year, there were a couple that were pretty noteworthy. There was one that went through Philadelphia in early June. That one, as far as derechos go, that was kind of on the lower end of things. You know, the max winds were only quote unquote 80 or 90 miles an hour, but it, it hit a big East coast city. So it got a lot of attention and it did a ton of damage and resulted in a few deaths from falling trees. So it was still a very big deal, but as far as derechos go, it was kind of low end. It just hit, hit a spot that it was impactful. Uh, there was a, big derecho that that affected iowa into illinois last summer that was the big one it uh, hit like cedar rapids iowa with winds of 140 miles an hour that's an extreme case that is not something we see every year wait, wait did you say 140 yeah they estimated winds in there of 140 and there's some videos out there on the internet it was it wasn't just one gust of wind it was like 30 40 minutes of just Every time there was a wind gust, trees are coming down, parts of roofs are blowing off. It was, it was, it was honestly probably didn't get the detention it deserved because it ravaged that town. So in terms of you now maybe severe weather in general, um, I do think June um, there there is some fairly active severe weather at times uh, from maybe like you know kind of the midsection of the country, maybe Iowa, Missouri, Arkansas, maybe even leaking into Kansas, Oklahoma east across the Ohio Valley and towards like parts of the East Coast, um, especially the northern mid-Atlantic. I do think there is some severe weather in June. Um, I, I don't want to predict a number of derechos. Um, <laughs> you know, could there be one? Sure. Um, you know, there probably will be a couple of derechos this summer, just very hard to predict ahead of time. And then in, in July might just kind of be more of a typical pattern. There might be some severe weather. There certainly could be some flooding if we get, you know, a nice feed of moisture into the eastern U.S., but I don't know if it's a very active severe pattern in July. In fact, I'd maybe lean against it. Yeah, and then uh, floating into the rest of summer, I guess we wrap it up here with August. And uh, I think this is wrapping up to be a little bit hotter along the eastern seaboard, huh? Yeah, so my thought is for August that, you know, as we kind of touched on in the tropical outlook, maybe the Bermuda Ridge flexes a little bit. And that pushes that weak spot in the jet stream where it's a little bit cooler, a little bit farther west, maybe more towards you know the Mississippi River Valley. And that allows warmer weather to start edging back into the East Coast. And that might be also quite humid. Um, so yeah, the month of August um, you know, might be an interesting month uh, on the East Coast. It might be, might be warm, might be very humid, might be a fair amount of rain across, you know, maybe from parts of the Eastern Gulf Coast and Florida into, into the Appalachians. Um, and maybe trending drier as you head towards northern New England. And then, you know, also across the west, you know, except for except for the monsoon and the desert southwest might be very dry across the west and also into the plains. Yeah, I mean, um, so, man, uh, that pretty much covers the summer, I would say. Uh, Brad, do you have any more on-the-spot questions that you want to grill Jim about? No, I mean, just, you know... <laughs> You know, of course, you know, we, we, we talked about the La Nina and, you know, how, again, that's more along the lines of uh, the hurricane outlook. But again, they, they just uh, they are very related, I guess, uh, how, you know, the impacts will be here across the United States uh, for the summer versus uh, the hurricane season. So, you know, again, like we said before, it's all 
intermingled together. So, you know, one thing impacts the other. Yeah, all goes, all goes hand in hand. Yeah, it's it's funny though. It's how how much more hype it seems like the winter forecast gets over the summer forecast. I just feel like there's that a little bit going on. You know, because because honestly, uh, snow impacts day to day life a lot more than than heat or thunder. I, again, yeah. not that summer doesn't impact people. Not that you know, there's a lot of weather in summer that can happen that can be you know hazardous to the general public if you're not careful also it can have big impacts on commodities as well if it's you know hot versus cold you know big big impacts on electrical demand if it's rainy versus dry big impacts to agriculture um so summer is still very important but i think the general public they're just like okay it's gonna be hot at times probably gonna rain at times um hopefully not on days where i want to you know do stuff outside or is in winter i i yeah I, you're right i don't know why but it just gets so much more hype i think it's just the obsession with snow i mean i mean how many times in the winter do you see social media facebook twitter whatever you know they've got the storm and oh my god look at how much snow could happen you never see that in the summer with the exception of a tropical system now obviously you know oh look at where the hurricane is going to make landfall in 10 days you know what if it's if it's hitting your area in 10 days you're probably safe because it's not going to be there in 10 days it's going to be somewhere else so i mean it's snowstorms a little different you know obviously like you said mike it, uh, or jim it, it impacts more people and you know it, it impacts more of a day day-to-day lifestyle versus a you know a 10 day out hurricane well i mean i think that pretty much wraps it up now that we're heading into summer i think everybody's you know, getting ready for those vacations and, uh, you know, hopefully as uh, you know, coming out of spring here, the uh, the whole COVID situation will improve, too. Yeah, I think there's a little more freedom this uh, this summer, uh, you know, of course, with the vaccinations and things like that. I think it's going to be a little bit more, you know, folks are going to get out and enjoy, uh, you know, a few more things, uh, including myself. And it's just a lot a, of pent up energy for sure. I, um, I mean, I think you're right, Jim. I think this could be, this could be an interesting summer. For I a lot mean, of- I'm, I'm looking forward to, you know, yeah, I'm looking forward to, you know, to being able to you know go out like normal again. Yeah. Uh, things like concerts coming back. Fireworks, you know? everything. Yeah. Ex- exactly. So yeah, hopefully, hopefully we, you know, a little, little heat doesn't hurt any, well, a lot of heat hurts anyone. A little heat, it is what it is, but hopefully we have some dry weather, at least on the days where we want to do stuff outside, as it does need to rain a little bit or else everything just turns brown and we get go into a drought. So, Well, that is true. We don't need that happening. And you know, I don't think there's been a large drought, uh, at least in Pennsylvania, New Jersey area, no, where we're located. Hasn't. Wild. Yeah. New England, New England actually had a fairly like upstate New York, New England actually had a fairly bad drought last summer. Um, now it, it's they're honestly they're close to slipping back into one this summer. So I'm I know the Mid Atlantic, like New Jersey, PA, South towards like you know Maryland, Delaware, Virginia. It's been dry the last you know several weeks. Been fairly dry, um, and. You know, there's concern, but I do think it turns around here through the summer. I don't think we have a big drought concern. You, you never know. You know, I'll, I'll I'll be holding my breath until it turns wetter. Um, that's just the nature of it. But I am a little bit worried that maybe upstate New York, New England again can dry out at times this summer because again they're already pretty dry and they're already pretty far in the hole this year. Um, and I am worried the moisture maybe goes a little bit south of them this summer. Well, let's hope that uh, doesn't happen this year because we don't want everybody, everything drying up and crops being damaged and all that kind of stuff. I mean, geez, I remember when I was a, a, a senior, might have been a senior or junior in high school, there was a pretty bad drought. And I used to work for a landscaping company and we would go out to cut 20 lawns and we'd come back with like one or two that we actually did. Um, so, you know, for the, for the sake of that industry, let's, let's hope that doesn't happen. And it doesn't look like it is, according to your forecast, Jim. Um, so, hey, Jim, I'm glad you're on once again. I think we're going to let you go. <laughs> yeah, so, no problem. You got me two in a row. Um, and before before we know it, we'll be talking about winter. But again, <laughs> as, as I think I said in the last one, I'm going to enjoy this few months of bliss, you know, you know, warm thoughts. Um, I don't know what what snow is. Um, Before we start bugging you again, what what's the winter looking like, Jim? Come on, colder colder than summer, Brad. Colder than summer. <laughs> Sometime in August, I'll be on the phone uh, with Jim. Hey, how you doing, Jim? Uh, you know, we're gonna start talking about winter. But uh, until then, <laughs> we'll give Jim a few months off. 
Um, so thanks, Jim, for being with us here on the Weather Lounge once sure. again. Yeah. And, um, you know, Brad, that about wraps it up for this episode of the Weather Lounge. Um, and remember, if you uh, have any suggestions for the show, please uh, email us at weatherlounge at weatherworksinc.com. Uh, that's the place to go. You know, drop us a line. We'll certainly respond. Um, remember this podcast. We have a new one every two weeks. So please join us again. And we'll also, we also are found on tons of platforms from uh, Spotify to Apple to Stitcher uh, to Google. Uh, we're pretty much everywhere. Just search the Weather Lounge. Otherwise, uh, you can find Weather Works on social media. Visit us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn. That's all for the show for this week. So please come and join us in another week or two. So thank you for listening and we'll see you next time.